from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the Southern Oregon Television Award for 2020 for the Best Education Show. I'm producer and host, John Letts. Ramping Up Your English is for intermediate level English language learners. If you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and you want to reach higher levels of proficiency, this program is designed to get you to that goal. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Native Americans. This is episode 100. In our previous episode, we saw some of the actions of some Europeans, especially Spaniards, who had a lot of effect on Native Americans throughout the continent. Today's episode looks at what happened up to the north as people from Spain, explorers and settlers, ended up doing more and more and having a bigger and bigger presence in the Americas and how that affected the people who already lived there. So we have a video clip called Al Norte, just to the north in Spanish. So let's watch the clip, Al Norte. <laughs> Have you ever wondered what stories were told around the campfires of Native Americans? Especially those who knew about the strange invaders who came from across the big water. Tales of their cruel and deceitful interaction must have held listeners in rapt attention. For those close to the affected villages, it must have raised terror that they would be next. The very survivor who reached them would likely be carrying the same disease that had wiped out his own village. Those further away may have thought the terrible stories some kind of frightening fiction, for the cruel, savage, and uncivilized behavior would seem unlikely, illogical, uncalled for. Yet, how could anyone make this up? The warriors warming themselves would know about killing, slavery, and even torture. But this total warfare, this extermination of whole villages, and destruction of culture and religion, this would seem alien even to the most jaded warrior. Those in the American Southwest would hear stories of the four benevolent strangers who wandered from village to village to heal the afflicted with their cross-like gestures. They were called Children of the Sun. Perhaps some would relate how they became part of the crowd that left home to follow them to the next village. How they must have been powerful Kachinas and such strange ones with pale skin and skin as black as charcoal. The deeds of the Spaniards would surely have been shared in some areas, a requiem of warning, of foreboding. Did flint knappers set to work making more weapons? Were the few survivors of this devastation taken into other tribes? Were alliances made for mutual defense? There's so much we don't know from the point of view of Native Americans. We do know the stories told by Spaniards. Once he returned to New Spain, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca was interviewed by the Viceroy. And the Viceroy re-enslaved Estevanico and ordered him to guide an expedition into the American Southwest 
after hearing tales about rich cities in that region. A legend was born of the seven cities of Cibola. Dreams of subduing another Tenochtitlan or Cusco animated entry into the country north of Mexico, El Norte. Hernando de Soto didn't need any such tales to launch an expedition to the southeast. He was sure he could succeed where the Narvaez expedition had failed. Neither Cabeza de Vaca nor the other Spaniards agreed to go on either adventure. They had had enough of mainland North America. Cabeza de Vaca returned to Spain to write of his years in the southwest and the customs and culture of the indigenous people there, which he named La Relacion de Alva Nunez Cabeza de Vaca. In his work, he communicated compassion and respect for the Native Americans he encountered in his eight years. He added another account entitled Comentarios. Both accounts were renamed Naufracios, which means shipwrecks in Spanish. Hence, his writings today exist as Naufragios y Comentarios, which has been translated into English. For Native Americans in Florida, the nine years since the Narvaez incursion was anything but miraculous. Whole communities were wiped out by European diseases for which they had no immunity. Many were terrorized by Spanish attacks. Their hospitality turned to demands that could not be met. People still living in Mississippian culture cities were left reeling from Spanish interference in their politics, lies, kidnapping, and murder. When those hated Spanish invaders launched into the Gulf of Mexico, the people of Florida could be forgiven if they prayed for the blue waters to swallow them. Some of the communities were just starting to recover from their first experience with Spanish conquistadors when a new group of 500 to 700 landed, they wasted no time in showing them they were not welcome. Hernando de Soto was convinced that a cache of gold must exist in a city like Tenochtitlan or Cusco, where he had gained a fortune supporting Cortes and Pizarro in attacking the rulers of those civilizations. He was no less brutal in his treatment of people in Florida. He never hesitated to use his pack of war dogs to terrorize the people. He pitted rivals against each other, kidnapped chiefs and shaman, stole food and valuables, and always demanded where the cities of gold were to be found. Community leaders in Florida suggested that cities full of riches could be found to the north and must have been glad to see these vile strangers leave. But they didn't leave alone. De Soto brought with him the equipment for enslavement, and he forced native people to carry the gear he had brought with him from one location to another. Many managed to escape using their knowledge of the country, but those caught trying to do so would have hands or feet cut off. Those indigenous people in Florida had probably heard of the Spaniards before De Soto appeared, but the people living to the north may have had no such warning, and they may have had trouble believing stories of such terrible and needless cruelty. As they traveled northward with pigs, mules, horses, and slaves, the strangers diminished the food supplies of those who welcomed them, then brutally punished their hosts when the Spaniards had overstayed their welcome. Nonetheless, some willingly joined the strangers, hoping to use the deadly power of the Spaniards against adversaries. Hostages were taken when moving from one community to another. They moved north as far as today's North Carolina. Here they encountered communities reeling from mass death from diseases, either carried ahead of their travels or from previous Spanish incursions. Determined to find cities with great wealth, 
DeSoto drove his men and hostages across the mountains. Native people in today's Alabama had heard about DeSoto's deprivations and that they had reached nearby Coosa. Scattered communities nearby were organized by Chief Tuscaloosa. They joined together to lure DeSoto into a trap. Near Mobile Bay, they attacked. DeSoto himself was wounded, and his people lost most of their supplies, but at a huge cost to the people of the area. Thousands of warriors and resistors were killed. Their resistance was met with brutality. DeSoto ordered his men to burn the village after killing all the Native Americans they could reach. Hoping to outrun any pursuers, DeSoto turned northwest, left to bear the winter of 1540 and 41 with few provisions. DeSoto enlisted indigenous guides who took him to the edge of the Mississippi River. This great river was a unifying element to numerous indigenous communities. To DeSoto, it was an obstacle. This painting by William H. Powell shows native people cowering before these strong Spanish explorers, which belies the account of the historical writer Garcilaso de la Vega. By now, De Soto's party were exhausted and destitute. De Soto spent the next two years scouring present-day Arkansas for gold, but he found none. The strangers endured another brutal winter, wherein interpreter Juan Ortiz died. By May of 1540, Hernando de Soto was also dead. De Soto's body was weighed down with sand and dumped in the river at night. Luis de Moscoso de Alvarado took command and led the survivors to Texas, then headed back to the Mississippi River. When a young native boy led the party astray, Moscoso fed him to the dogs. One of the last remnants of the Mississippian culture were the cities of the Cadoan people. They hosted the dying party of strangers during the 1542 year. Natives had shown them how to use native plants burned to ashes to replenish the salt in their bodies. The Spanish ignored the advice of those they regarded as savages, even as their fevered bodies turned green and started to rot for lack of salt. Back along the Mississippi River between Arkansas and Louisiana, Moscoso decided they had had enough of El Norte and had the survivors build boats to take the river south to New Spain. The people along the Mississippi had also had enough of the cruel, arrogant invaders. They met them with war canoes as they floated south with the strong current reducing their number even further. When survivors returned to New Spain, they attacked each other, reducing the survivors to an even smaller group. Native Americans who had encountered the DeSoto expedition were left with disaster. Between diseases and attacks, up to 90% of some communities were killed. Survivors were left without family, community, or friends. They were left with no more faith in their religions. Little was left for them but to seek death. I am a wayfarer and stranger on a journey through this world. And there's no sickness, toil, no danger. Scattered survivors form new tribes, with none of the hierarchical structure as before. Most of the leading families were gone. The sacred bond with the land was broken. 
Farming communities became hunting societies. Big cities never recovered. They were replaced by small, scattered towns. Leadership by merit replaced hereditary chiefdom. The Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, and Chickasaw survived as tribes, but the nature of their ways of life changed dramatically. When future expeditions came to the southeast, they were struck by these changes and the small populations they encountered, the legacy of De Soto. There were great riches in the American Southwest. With knowledge and humility, people had lived well here for thousands of years. The mountains and rivers welcomed and nurtured those who called this place home. The rich religious life included kachinas, spirits that looked over the people and made sure they lived right. Gathering in the kivas of the pueblos for religious rites, people emerged to the surface each time as a reminder of how their people emerged from the earth to become the people. The Southwest was rich in diversity, a cacophony of distinct languages, cultures, and communities. Some were quite insular, having little to do with neighboring pueblos while they were bound together by trade and sometimes with mere tolerance. The Navajo and their cousins, the Apache, traded with the people of the Pueblo, as Pueblo ancestors had long since abandoned their own trade centers. Forming the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans, there was a balance between the needs of the community and its gifts supplied from the corn maiden. This diverse country was alive, interacting with the people who sought balance and harmony. The disturbance caused by those four strangers of unusual color were no real threat to their ways of life. But a new disturbance was coming. In Mexico City, Viceroy Mendoza had heard from the survivors of the Norvaez expedition about a mystical place in the southwest where there were cities of gold and he wanted a piece of that. Mendoza invested in an expedition guided by Cabeza de Vaca survivor Estevanico into that region in search for the seven cities of Cibula. Estevanico went ahead of the main expedition with a handful of Spanish soldiers. When expedition leader Francisco Vázquez de Coronado entered with hundreds of soldiers and thousands of horses, he was told that Estevanico had been killed. To this day, we don't really know if the African was really killed, or did he fake his death to live as a free man among the people he had come to respect and love. We have no proof either way. <laughs> In the year 1540, Coronado set out with a party numbering over a thousand people and a huge herd of horses, traveling north toward the city of the Zuni people, a city the Spaniards called Cibula. Believing this area to be close to the ocean, Coronado sent part of the expedition in boats to help provision this horde of strangers. The Zunis were people who lived in modest villages. At Hoika, they knew of Coronado's approach. After sending their women, children, and elders to the mountains for protection, they prepared to defend their pueblo. Spanish soldiers mounted on horseback stopped short of the village. The leader spoke a language that was unknown to them, but his gestures indicated they were hungry and they demanded food. They also wanted to enter the Pueblo. The Zunis communicated that the strangers would not be allowed in the Pueblo, and they had no food to spare. At this, the strangers attacked. 
Izumi warriors protected their town. Hundreds of Zuni warriors were killed. Coronado and his starving men entered the village. It was now deserted. They found corn and turkeys. They ate. The Hopi had lived in this harsh land for hundreds of years before seeing Europeans. They had a deep religious tradition, a tight community, and distinctive ways of arranging the hair of girls not yet married. In one pueblo, Captain Don Garcia de Cardenas appeared with Spanish soldiers demanding food. The people there didn't know that Cardenas had orders from Coronado to show no mercy, to make other pueblos fear the Spaniards. Cardenas complied, wiping out the whole village. Cardenas traveled to other Hopi villages as runners fanned out to warn neighbors of the danger. Cardenas demanded that he be led to the river, so a guide brought him within sight of the Colorado River. It was seen from the rim of the Grand Canyon, too far below to reach. Cardenas proclaimed the canyon as useless country and returned to Coronado empty-handed. Unknown to the Zuni, the Hopi, and even the army of Coronado, Hernando de Alarcón navigated his fleet as far up the Colorado River as his boats would go. He was still a long way from the Coronado party. He buried the supplies and left a note for Coronado in a bottle. Coronado gave up on resupply and began following the Rio Grande River to Pueblo villages at Pecos. The people there abandoned the village, so Coronado set up his winter quarters there. The familiar pattern of taking slaves and demanding food led to a war there where hundreds of Native Americans lost their lives. One Puebloan decided to lead the party into the wilderness away from his people. He told Coronado about a city named Quivira, located far to the east. Coronado saw a chance to redeem the excursion and enrich himself. He fell for it. On the southern plains they met Apache hunters and saw huge herds of buffalo. The Apache hunters pointed them in the direction of Quivira, the guide they called Turk had hoped to get them hopelessly lost, but now he had to go along to Kansas. When Coronado reached Quivira, he found friendly Americans, but no gold. These ancestors of the Wichita lived good but simple lives in grass huts near the Arkansas River. And as for Turk, the guide who led the Spaniards away from Pueblo country, Coronado had him garroted, strangled. Coronado returned empty-handed to Pueblo country in New Mexico. He was badly hurt in a fall during a horse race. He decided he had had enough of El Norte, and he returned to New Spain. He would not return home weighed down with gold, and he was blind to the true riches of the area. Native Americans along his route would try to recover from his presence. Hundreds were killed in battles. Untold numbers died of hunger and exposure because of demands on their fragile economy. Shaman would begin the process of recovering in the absence of Coronado. Thirty-nine years later, Spaniards would return again. Coronado returned to face charges of war crimes. He lost his land holdings to creditors. Cardenas was convicted of war crimes by the Council of Indies in Spain. The bad ends reached by Coronado made the American Southwest unattractive to conquistadors. A generation of Native Americans there knew the Spaniards only through the stories they heard. When settlers cast their eyes northward, that changed. 
Several times, people from New Spain came north to establish settlements in Pueblo country. This always ended badly, sometimes for Native Americans, sometimes for settlers, and often for both. The worst came with the Spaniard named Don Juan de Oñate. He came north with over a thousand people and herds of horses and other animals, as well as wagons of supplies. He came to stay. Oñate attacked the village of Okama, killing over 900 villagers, many of them after they surrendered. Oñate torched the village, cut off hands and feet of the men, and sent the women and children south into slavery. All this transpired with full knowledge of the new laws imposed by the King of Spain. We'll learn about the new laws in our next episode. You're watching Ramping Up Your English, and just like that, we're out of time. So thank you for watching. This was episode 100. We'll see you next time on Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash woke TV. Join us next time on RBTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.